right, we're going we're gonna to jump in. Uh, before we get started tonight, uh, I've got a meme for you on the screens that I've never seen before just to loosen us up. There it is. There it is. Ponder, wonder, and we'll know in about seven and a half hours of who our next president is. But glad we, uh, glad we have the word of God and what a chapter that we get to be in tonight. Uh, how many of you guys did your homework over the last two weeks? Look around, men. Um, Here's what I want to hear from you before we get started. What are some of the central themes that you saw take place in Luke 14 through 44 in chapter 4? What are some of the central themes that you saw in this chapter? Prophecy fulfilled. Really good. Did you say unbelief? Yeah, very good. That God cares for the Gentiles. Really good, Rick. Somebody who was saying something over here? Go ahead, Vince. Yeah, Jesus' authority. Really good over the spiritual realm specifically. Way to go, Vince. What else? His humility, Shane. Well done. Yeah, Jesus proclaims the gospel. Manny, you just hit the title of what I've uh, given to our message tonight. Jesus proclaims the gospel. And we've just seen Jesus. He's been baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he withholds from food, starves his flesh for 40 days, and is tempted by none other than Satan himself. And three temptations are brought to him. And all three times, Jesus resists giving in to temptation by doing what, men? By not only quoting scripture, but by what? By actually living it out. It's one thing to just know the word of God in our head, to be able to spit scripture out in different places. It's a whole other thing to be able to put it into practice to make it the reality of our lives, to make it the response of our heart and of our mind. And this is what Jesus does. And we begin tonight in verse 14. If you're there, give me a big amen. Amen. Then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. Interesting that it begins in our chapter tonight talking about how Jesus is led or returns in the power of the Spirit. Here's what we've seen in the Holy Spirit's role in Jesus' life so far. We've seen that the power of the Spirit is involved at the birth or the conception of Jesus Christ. That it's through the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary that she will bear a son who is called holy the holy spirit is involved in jesus's baptism the spirit comes in almost a bodily form like a dove resting upon jesus and you hear a voice from heaven that says this is my dearly beloved son listen to him with him i am well pleased Jesus is again filled with the Holy Spirit as he's led into the wilderness and endures these 40 days without food and temptation from Satan. And once again, we see at the beginning of his public ministry, it says that he goes in the power of the Spirit. Now, there's a couple of things that I think are important for us to understand to demystify what needs to be demystified. Because oftentimes when we hear, well, spirit-filled life and the Holy Spirit, we think of magical power. We think of downloads from heaven. We think of -of out-of-body experiences. And yet what we know about the Holy Spirit is it's literally the third person of the Trinity who comes to dwell in us when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. And when it says Jesus going in the power of the spirit, that means Jesus wasn't going in whose power? His own. 
he emptied himself. And in order to follow his father's will obediently and perfectly, he was filled with the power of the spirit. And I want you to hold on to this, men. Being filled with the spirit is synonymous with applying God's word and will to your life. Being filled with the spirit is synonymous, meaning that it goes hand in hand. To be spirit filled, to live a life of the spirit simply means to apply God's word and his will to your life. It's not some crazy out of body experience. It's not something that you have to be really holy to attain. It comes through diligent study of God's word of knowing his likes and his dislikes, knowing what to say at the right time, just like Jesus did when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. When the smell of that bread came across his nose and Jesus knew God's word, man does not live by bread alone, Satan, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't need to provide for myself. I have a heavenly father who loves me and will provide for me in due time. Next temptation. Remember this in your own life so that when we hear Jesus respond, when we hear Jesus teach, when we hear Jesus interacting with others, it's not just because he's the son of God that he is so brilliant and wise. It's because he's filled with the spirit, which means he's applying God's word, the same thing that's been given to us. And he's living out God's will instead of his own, the same calling upon our life. Verse 16, so he came to Nazareth. What's significant about Nazareth, by the way? Nothing good. Uh, It's his hometown. It's where he grew up. And it's where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Uh, This is a small sentence by Luke that carries some profound meaning. How many of you remember when Kanye West started going to church? Whatever church, like, yeah, Noah May, you're like one of two guys that know. Uh, Within a month, he had 10,000 people at his church in this massive choir and this big following. How many of you remember when Justin Bieber started going to church? How many of you don't know who Justin Bieber is? Uh, the latest one is Russell Brand. Has anyone seen Russell Brand? He's uh, doing videos in his underwear and sharing the gospel. It's really strange. I don't know what's real and what's not, but uh, praise the Lord that he's pointing people to Jesus Christ, I guess. When these celebrities that aren't men of faith start turning to Jesus, or at least they give the appearance of it, people are amazed. They're in awe. They'll flock to these churches to see a spectacle. But in the hometown where Jesus grew up, as was his custom, which simply means what he did every single Sabbath, It would have been a small synagogue. Nazareth Nazareth was not a big place. He came in, and I'm sure like he had done before, he was going to read the passage of the day. And men, I want you to know this. In your own lives, it's not just about going to church, but it is about being consistent in your faith. Because when you do the small things that God has called you to, They can have a profound impact, not only on your life, but in your marriage and in the life of your family and in the life of your community. The consistency in our faith, it may seem small, but this is how God builds a man over time. Each one of you are here. You could be watching the election results. You could be somewhere else. And you've chosen week in and week out to regularly come on a Tuesday night to be built to grow in your knowledge so that you can apply God's word to your lives. Well done. And it's something that Jesus himself did, as was his custom. Verse 17. 
he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. And he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And Jesus began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now just imagine what we get to know today that Jesus is the son of God, fully man, fully God, left heaven, came to earth Could you imagine being in that little tiny synagogue when Jesus stood up to read these words? The gift that we've been given from God that the people sitting in this synagogue did not yet understand. I'm so filled with gratitude that when I get to read these words from Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2, I know exactly who they pertain to. Because it's been revealed to me in God's grace, his love, his mercy. I know who the Messiah is. I know who my Redeemer is and my Savior is. And the people who sat in the synagogue that day, they simply saw Joseph's son. They saw a carpenter by trade. They saw not the Messiah but someone that was just like them. And I encourage you to consider the gift that you've been given to know who Jesus is. And it is amazing to me how sovereign God is in this moment. Uh, We don't know. It does say that he was handed the book or the scroll of Isaiah. I don't know if this passage was chosen for him by the rabbi who oversaw the synagogue or if Jesus himself specifically went to this passage, but either way, it is not accidental. That the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the Messiah, speaks these words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We just covered where we've seen the Spirit of the Lord at work in Jesus' life, at his conception, at his birth, at his baptism, at his temptations in the wilderness, and then going in the power of the Spirit back to his hometown in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Then the prophet Isaiah says, because he has anointed me. He, meaning God the Father, has anointed Jesus the Son. And when we consider anointing from an Old Testament perspective, what type of people were anointed? Kings and prophets, and those in the service of the Lord like priests. And Jesus fulfills all those roles. He was anointed. He was chosen. Authority was specifically given to him by God. And now the question is this. Well, if he is the Messiah, if he is the anointed one, if the spirit of God is upon him, for what purpose? Why did he come? What is his role? What can we expect from the Messiah? Not according to what we want him to do, which we'll see here in the Jewish people and their expectations, but instead what God's word said that he would come to do. Remember, Jesus is quoting from an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah. This was prophesied 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. And yet this is what it says will be the Messiah's ministry. It says specifically to preach the gospel to the poor. If you uh, have a highlighter or a pen or you're underlining things, highlight to preach the gospel. What does gospel mean, by the way? Simply means good news. Now, it's interesting because in order to understand that something's good news, you have to first what? 
you got to know that there's bad news or everything is just, it's just news. It's just news. And Jesus says, I have come to preach the gospel to who? To the poor. Well, certainly this applies to the literal poor people, those that wouldn't get a second glance, those that were ignored by society. Jesus gives time and love and mercy and kindness to the least of these most definitely. But here the poor doesn't mean based on your bank account. The poor means what? Very good. You know your Bibles, men. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or in other words, blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are those who recognize, man, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I'm not good enough. I can't save myself. I'm not clothed in righteousness on my own. Jesus has come to preach the good news to the poor. What good news? I want to hear from you guys. What's the good news? Salvation. Uh, that's, that's the right word, but you got to give me more. Where does salvation come from? It comes through the Messiah who is Jesus Christ alone. So when the gospel is preached to the poor, it means that Jesus is revealing who he is as the way of salvation to all who will come to him that are humble in spirit. That's what Isaiah means when he preaches the gospel to the poor. The next thing Jesus quotes from Isaiah is, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Again, underline sent and heal. Sent and heal. Jesus has been sent by the Father to bring healing to who? The brokenhearted. In Ezekiel chapter 34, which I would encourage you to read on your own time. God is speaking to the shepherds of Israel who have led the people astray. And he has some harsh words for them. And then he goes into saying, I am the good shepherd. I will send myself to gather my people. And specifically in Ezekiel 34, 16, God says this, I will seek what was lost, bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. Who did Jesus just describe? Oh, he described all of us. Broken, sick, lost, driven away. And what's his ministry? What's the good news of the gospel that he has been sent to heal the brokenhearted? Jesus then continues and says to proclaim liberty to the captives. Underline proclaim liberty. Do you see yourself or have you seen yourself in your past as a captive? And what is, what would we be captive to? To sin. And if we were to get more specific, man, the list is long. Pornography. Fear of failure. Past mistakes. Bad business deals. Lack of integrity. Blowing up on our spouse. Not stewarding our children. The list could go on. And he comes to do what? Proclaim liberty, freedom from the power of sin that holds us in shame, that holds us in guilt, that holds us captive. He's come to proclaim liberty. And not only to proclaim liberty to the captives, but to give recovery of sight to the blind. Men who are blind. All of mankind, think of that for just a moment. Besides Jesus and Adam, no one has ever been born with sight. All men, all women, born in their sinful nature, unable to clearly and properly see what is true and right, lovely and pure, 
until Jesus Christ comes into their life and gives them the recovery of their sight. That is a wild truth to me because oftentimes, how do we think we see things? Ah, I know the right answer. I know what to do. If you would have just come to me, how many of you have ever said that to your kids (laughs) or to your spouse or to people in your companies? If you would have just come to me, I've got the answers. I see things. All of us were blind. And the only way we can recover our sight is through Jesus Christ as Lord. The importance of the gospel message. To set all at liberty who are oppressed. Because this is what sin does. This is what demonic forces do. This is ultimately what Satan is doing is he oppresses us. And that oppression cannot be lifted without the power of Jesus and God's spirit bringing truth and life and light into our hearts and minds. And finally, Jesus says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Interesting that Jesus says to proclaim acceptable the year of the Lord. We don't have the time to dedicate it to it tonight, but if you want to write down Leviticus chapter 25, specifically verses 8 through 17, but really the whole chapter applies. This year of Jubilee or this year of the Lord that was being prophesied by Isaiah was found in the Levitical law. And like a lot of things found in the law, the law or its ceremonies or its feasts are constantly pointing to Jesus Christ. And no different for the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, Israel was instructed that if someone had been put into servitude or slavery because they couldn't pay a debt or someone's property was taken back or had to be sold in order for them to pay a debt, or if they lost a child that needed to go into indentured servitude to pay a debt at that 50th year, what would happen, men? Everything would be restored. All debts would be wiped out. People would be returned to their homes and homes would be returned to their people. And we're just talking about property and individuals. What is Jesus talking about? Set free from what? Set free from sin and the power of death. Your debt paid that you could never pay anyways. What a passage written 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. I have a little uh, chart for you, which I'll get to in just a moment. But it's so important for us to understand what the gospel is. And I want to give you a very broad definition, but it'll be helpful if you don't already know it. Here is what the gospel is. The gospel is simply the good news about Jesus as the way to salvation. Men say that with me. What is the gospel? The good news about Jesus as the way to salvation, which means if we ever find ourselves trying to bring someone to Christ by sharing the gospel and it's without Jesus, we should close our mouth and reevaluate what we're saying. And that seems like a foolish thing to do, but how easy is it to get caught up in, hey, you got to go to church. Yep. Hey, you got to stop watching those movies. Did I just, did I just hear you drop an F-bomb? Bro, do you smoke weed? You can't smoke weed as a Christian anymore. Now, these things may be the fruit that come from Jesus coming into your life, but they are not the gospel. And how true it is on a night where we elect a president as a nation that so much of American Christianity has become rooted in politics. That is not the gospel, men. Undoubtedly, we have a responsibility to use the right that we have to vote and to vote biblical values, which is what we've been preaching for two months now. But politics are not the gospel. And clean living is not the gospel. And cleaning yourself up is not the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his character, his power, 
his love for others, which is the way to salvation. This is what Jesus came to proclaim. This is why what he's saying in this tiny little synagogue of Nazareth is so important, so impactful, because it's not just for the 30 people that are in that synagogue. It's for the world. What Isaiah had written 700 years earlier was now being fulfilled in their presence. And we see the contrast between Jesus' ministry and then the sin of the world. I have it here on your screens. We're going to go through those two verses again from Isaiah 61 really quickly, looking at two different categories, the results of sin and then Jesus' ministry. The results of sin is this. Sin brings what? It brings poverty. It brings poverty. Have you ever thought about why sin brings poverty? It literally steals from us. It robs from us. It makes our life small and our vision small. It causes us to desire things of man instead of trusting in what we can't even imagine that God desires to provide for us. The result of sin is poverty, but Jesus is ministry. He's our provider. He gives us everything we need. Maybe not everything we want, but he provides everything we need because he comes to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit, to those who are humble. The result of sin also brings brokenness. Jesus talks about how he's been sent to heal the brokenhearted. And how many of you in here have had broken hearts over decades? Some because of your own sin, some because of sin done to you, some because of lost opportunities, wondering, God, would you still use me? Could I still be part of your family or your team after what I've done? And Jesus comes to heal in his ministry, to heal what's been broken, to bind up, to restore what's been lost. The results of sin enslave people. We literally, according to Ephesians chapter two, verses one through three, are a slave to our flesh and a slave to Satan himself. We are children of darkness and of wrath. There's nothing we can do to remove ourselves from that family. But God, rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, by grace we have been saved. That brokenness, that enslavement, then Jesus comes, and like the year of Jubilee, he sets us free. Sets us free from the power of sin. We no longer, men, have to say yes to sin. Is it still a temptation for us? You bet and often strong in different areas, but we no longer have to say yes to sin because he always provides a way out. He gives us the truth of his word. He gives us the power of his Holy Spirit to know his will and then to be able to put it into application and practice in our lives. The result of sin is that we're blind. And Jesus brings sight. The result of sin is that we're oppressed, but Jesus delivers. And finally, the result of sin is that we are debtors. And we are debtors that could never pay our debt. And he redeems us. There's nothing he needs from us. And yet he pays our debt in full through his own son, Jesus Christ on the cross. Man, this is the gospel the good news about Jesus as the way to salvation. The apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter one, verse 16, let's read it on our screens, one loud voice. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek What I love about what Paul says is he begins by saying, I'm not ashamed, meaning I am a sinner. I am not worthy. 
I am not good enough. I am all that's lacking. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. The only way we can come into eternal life is by believing in Jesus as Lord, that he died for our sins, and that he rose from the dead. There's no other way. And this is offensive to the world, isn't it? Because it is an offensive message. What about all those faithful Muslims who pray three times or five times a day? What about all the really good Mormons who are very moral and they're so kind and family oriented? What about, and you fill in the blank. The good news is about Jesus as the way of salvation. There is no other way. And I'm not ashamed to proclaim it. I'm not ashamed to have those hard conversations. I'm not ashamed to tell a person who thinks they're a good person. You're not. And you want to know how I know that? Because you're just like me. And I'm not either. Jesus closes the book. Gives it back to the attendant. And he sits down. Now a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. One in Jewish culture. When a person reading would sit down. It didn't mean they were done. It was actually a posture of now they were going to unpack the passage. Now they were going to teach. But Jesus does something profound here. He does something that is important for us to pay attention to. He doesn't finish Isaiah chapter 61 verse 2. He stops. How many of you caught that in your homework? There's a reason why Jesus did this, and we're going to cover that in just a moment. But here's why it's so important for us as men to have understanding of what the gospel is and what the gospel isn't. It's because understanding the gospel enables us to become effective builders of men. I want you to think about this for a moment when you consider being a husband, when you consider being a dad or a grandfather or an uncle or a mentor or an employer of other men. Understanding the gospel helps us to be an effective builder of men because when we go through that chart that we had up on the screen, and we look at the results of sin versus Jesus' ministry, the, the, the results of the gospel. Well, what does that look like in your marriage? Are you enslaving your wife? Are you building her? Are you helping to bring healing to her brokenness by leading her in Christ? Where she's blinded by maybe her emotions. Are you able to point her to see clearly through God's word? Where she may be indebted or thinking that she needs to make up for what she lacks. Have you given grace so that she can be redeemed knowing that she's enough? To your children, are you causing them poverty thinking that you're robbing them of joy. Everything is just about rules. What were your grades like? Did you follow this? Did you follow this? Did you follow this? And heaping heavy burdens on your children that they can't keep. Or are you a provider of encouragement, of right and healthy discipline, of stretching your children but not breaking them in half? When we understand the gospel, men, it allows us to become effective builders of other men, of other women, especially those closest to us. This is why Jesus came. John 3.16, you know it well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then John 3, 17 is for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to what? Which is why Jesus closes the book before he gets to the second part of verse two. 
Why did Jesus come? Why did he come, men? To save lost sinners. To do all those things that we just discussed. To give sight to the blind. To heal the brokenhearted. To give provision to those who are poor in spirit. To pay the debts of the debtors who could never pay it on their own. This is why he came the first time. And he shuts the book. I have it on your screens, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, as it appears in the Old Testament passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings, that's the gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim acceptable the year of the Lord. And then Jesus stops and sits down and does not say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Why would he do that? Why would he stop there? What do you think? I want to hear. That's the second coming. Really good, Tim. Anybody else? Comes later. Because Jesus wants everyone to know, I came to save lost sinners the first time. There will be a day of judgment. The return of Christ, his second coming, as these men said. But here we find ourselves in this 2,000 year gap between that age of grace, of Jesus pursuing the lost, both Jew and Gentile, offering the healing to the nations. Because the day is coming where God will enact his vengeance on a Christ rejecting world. But that day is not here yet. And Jesus was so intentional to pause there and to hand a book back to the attendant. And for those men in that synagogue who knew their Torah well, what do you think that caused them to start doing? (laughs) Definitely to think. Why did he stop there? And we're going to see that this becomes the source of contention, doesn't it? Notice what happens. Verse 20. It says, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What did Jesus just do? He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the one that Isaiah had prophesied about 700 years earlier. He made it as clear as day and in your sight today is the day of salvation. It has come. What you've been waiting for, for millennia, he is here. And I bet you could hear a pin drop in that synagogue. I bet the wheels were turning in everybody's heads, trying to figure out what was being said, trying to figure out what was happening. Verse 22, so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. At this point in 22, how do you think people are receiving Jesus? It, yeah, I agree, Brooks. According to Luke, they're like, man, his words are so gracious. He speaks with authority. Like, this is different. This is amazing. And then. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Meaning, we know this guy. He's grown up among us. His dad's worked with us. We've seen him grow up in his own business. Is this not Joseph's son? And then Jesus said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever have we heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. We're going to stop there for a moment. It doesn't say in Luke that the people spoke their thoughts out loud. It just says that Jesus responds to what he knows that they're thinking. Undoubtedly, you will quote this proverb to me. If you're really who you say you are, do what? Heal yourself, prove it. Now, when 
Do people say to Jesus in his life, heal yourself, save yourself? Wow. What is Jesus doing in this very moment? Wow. He is foretelling what is to come at the hands of his own people. Undoubtedly, you will quote to me this proverb. When your Messiah is on the cross paying the penalty for your sins, healing your broken hearts, paying the debt you could never pay. Save yourself. If you're so great, prove it. You saved others. Get down from the cross. Uh, Jesus, this is a bad ministry plan. Things were going really good. They were kind of liking what you were saying. But they weren't and he knew it. You see, the Jews thought something about themselves. What did they think about themselves? They were God's chosen people, and that's true. But because they were God's chosen people, what did they think about their spiritual condition? Oh, say it again, Bert. They didn't need to be saved. Self-righteous. We're good enough. Why do you think they might have gotten mad that Jesus stopped in Isaiah 61 2 where he stopped? What did they want him to do? They wanted the day of vengeance to come upon their enemies. They wanted to see judgment on the Romans because they thought highly of themselves and saw the rest of the world as trash, garbage. You're welcome. Snuck that one in there, huh? (laughs) Who is this a warning to, by the way? Very good. Who said us? Who said that? Oh, Landon, you cheater. Why, Landon? You got to say it louder. Really good. Listen, men, we should be in church. We should be in men's ministry. We should be studying our Bibles. And do you know what the problem is or the temptation is as we do that more? We start to think what? We're righteous. We're We're something. I know things. My life is changing. I don't do this anymore. Instead, I do what's right. And even though those are good things, the moment that we start to think that we're something, boy, are we in trouble. And the Jews had this mentality. They wanted to see judgment come upon the world because they thought they were exempt from it. And nothing could have been further from the truth. Jesus came to save his people, the Jews, from what? From their sins. Because even though they were the chosen people of God, meaning he chose their nation to be a light unto the other nations to reveal who he was. They were still sinners who needed a savior, which is why they had been waiting for a Messiah, but they lost sight of why they needed one so bad. May we not fall into the same traps. Men, you are doing the right thing. Pastor Dave says this often. You're in the center of God's will by being here. But may none of us start to think we're something, that we're amazing that we're righteous on our own accord because it puts us in a very precarious position. We start wishing the judgment on other people and they're lost just like we were. They're in need of a savior just like I am, just like you are. And it can cause us to lose our compassion, which the Jews had none for the Gentiles. And yet God chose them to be the light to the Gentiles. And how far they had fallen. How misunderstood they, they truly were. Jesus prophesies, you're going to say this to me. Heal yourself. Prove it to us. Be the Messiah that we want you to be. And men, I want you to know this. Jesus proclaims to be the Messiah that people need, not the Messiah that people want. He proclaims to be the Messiah that people need, not the Messiah that people want. 
And it's not unusual for us to hear this in our day. You know, I, I started going to church like eight weeks ago. I gave my life to Christ a month ago. And, you know, God's just not done anything for me. But how many of us have been there too with that thought process? Probably many of us in this room. Or many of us still think this way. God, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what's right. I've really cleaned things up. And you're not holding up your end of the deal. Like somehow we had a plan for God to follow. And it's just easy to get there, isn't it? He's the Messiah that we need. And it's important for us to be introspective and look at our own wants and desires and then to go to God's word in order to find out, am I following his will or my will? And for these Jews... They got caught up following their will, their expectations of the Messiah, what they wanted. And it literally blinded them to who was there in that little tiny synagogue before them. You imagine you're one of 30 guys in a room with the creator of the universe. And you're indignant towards him. Because without his mercy and grace revealing who he is, we would all be in the same boat. Prove it. You think you're something special? Go ahead. Show me. I think I'm better than you. It's just the way our sin nature works. Then Jesus really goes after the heart of things. He says in verse 24, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Now, this isn't Jesus throwing a pity party for himself. Israel went through this cycle over and over again. How how popular were the prophets? I mean, think of what a prophet is. What's the definition of a prophet? A messenger from God. Like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, no. The prophets come into Judah. The prophets come into Israel. How are they treated? They're beaten or they're stoned to death or they're ridiculed or they're imprisoned or they're insulted, scoffed at, made fun of, rejected. They have lonely ministries. It is a difficult calling to be a prophet. And Jesus simply calls a spade a spade. No prophet has ever been welcome in his home country. I didn't expect to be either. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, meaning there was a drought for three and a half years, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, which, by the way, is not Israel, to a woman who was a widow. Jesus references 1 Kings chapter 17, and he gives this story about the prophet Elijah. How many of you guys went into 1 Kings 17 and spent time reading? Then most of you know the story. I'm not going to go into the details. But Jesus is saying, you know, God sends his prophets to who? To the Gentiles. And then he gives another example. Verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. He's the one who preceded Elijah. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. How many of you guys remember this story from 2 Kings 5? It's an amazing story. Naaman is a pretty prideful general who's the best at his, at, at his job. He is a man of war. What's Naaman's problem? He's got leprosy. And... He sent by the king of Syria to the king of Israel and the king of Israel. What's he do when he hears of the king of Syria wanting him to heal Naaman? Tears his clothes, starts complaining and goes, this is just to pick a fight with me. I knew it. And Elisha, the prophet goes, chill out, keep your clothes on, send him to me. There is a prophet in Israel and they will know there is a God in Israel who can heal. You see, God had sent his prophets to heal the brokenhearted, to cure the diseased. And we already know, heading into Jesus' public ministry, whatever he's doing on the outside 
is nothing compared to what? His desire to cleanse the inside of that person. He doesn't heal for performance. He doesn't heal to be a spectacle or a sideshow. He heals for the purpose of revealing that he holds power over the physical and over the spiritual. And if he would care for people so much as to heal them on the outside, how much more does the Savior of the world desire to heal our own hearts, our souls for eternity? This is his ministry. This is why he's come to proclaim the gospel. And you can only imagine what is this doing to the men in the synagogue as they're listening to Jesus give these two examples about God sending healing to the Gentiles. What's it doing? They are livid. They're torqued. They're ticked. Their blood begins to boil and we see the true nature of their own hearts. It's interesting as I've worked with different people, different couples in the church. And sometimes it happens where whether it's a dating relationship or whether it's just a friendship and they invite somebody and then there's a rift between them. They don't want that person to come to church anymore. I understand why. It's awkward. It's difficult. It's hard. I get it. But where should our hearts be? Man, I want them to hear the word of truth. No matter how much I may disagree with them or be frustrated with them, I should desire for that neighbor, for that coworker, for that family member that I can't stand. Lord, would you do a mighty work in their heart? so that they can come to Jesus Christ as Lord and be saved. And that's just not where the Jews were. And if we're honest with ourselves, where are we at? Thanks for being honest, Carlos. Most of us aren't there. We wish what upon our enemies? Destruction, death, embarrassment, shame. And Jesus came to bind all those things up, to bring healing to them, to offer them to anyone and everyone who would worship him as Lord. And this infuriated the Jews because it put them in the same category as who? Wow. And that was difficult for them to receive. But we're all in the same boat, men. We're all made of the same dust. We all have the same sin nature. And no matter what our backgrounds are, our education or our bank accounts, all of us have a tremendous need for the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform our life and lead us to salvation through him alone. And it's the same for all mankind. So all those in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. Uh, this was actually pretty common in stoning. You would push someone off a cliff. The fall wouldn't kill them, but they were in a vulnerable position. And from the top of the cliff, people would then throw rocks and finish the job. This is their intent with Jesus. Now, I find this part a little humorous, even though this is a dark subject. They asked for a miracle and Jesus does give them a miracle. What's he do? We don't like Luke. Come on. You're the doctor who details everything. What do you mean? He just passed through. I don't know. But in all their wrath and their willingness to murder him, Jesus just whoosh, walks through or disappear. I don't know what happens. Why were they filled with such wrath? Why were they filled with such anger? And I would say this, many people today accuse Jesus of rejecting them because of who they are. And nothing could be further from the truth, men. In truth, it is people who reject Jesus because of who he is as Lord. Don't buy into the lie that Jesus doesn't accept the LGBTQ community because nothing could be further from the truth. Sin is sin. 
I'm a sinner. They're a sinner. The difference? Humility to go, man, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a savior. Will you please forgive me? Help me turn away from my sins so I can follow you. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord. He's willing to accept any and all of us. Now we can't come to him any way we please. But no matter where you're coming from, he will receive you. But you must receive him as Lord. Walk in his ways. Be redeemed by his gospel and salvation. Jesus doesn't reject people. People reject Jesus. Does that make sense? The Jews reject him. They want to kill him. He hasn't met their expectations. And I want to ask you, do you become angry at God when he doesn't meet your expectations? Is he to blame in your life when things don't go according to your plan? And I want you to know, men, this is our human condition. None of us can be above this. I'm sure all of us at least have had these thoughts or have these thoughts, but take them captive and remember who Jesus is and the gospel he came to preach because he's the one healing, providing. He's the one giving mercy. Pastor Dave preached on Sunday when God strengthens us, even though we don't deserve it, man, that hit me. What am I doing with the strength he gives me when I don't deserve it? Yeah, may we not be men who waste his grace, waste his strength, but may we remember who he is and what he's come to do. Verse 31, then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching for his words were with authority. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Make no mistake, Luke contrasts the people in Jesus's hometown who know who he is with who? With demons who call him by his true identity the Holy One of God. I wish we had more time to cover this section. I want to get you into your small groups, but know this, men, that Jesus displays authority and power over the spiritual realm. He calls this demon out by his own authority, by the way. No crazy incantations, probably no yelling and screaming, no slapping people on the forehead just simply by his own authority calls this demon out and the demon has to release the man. And here's why that's important. Here's why I want you to hold on to this particular part as well as the end of the chapter where Jesus continues to cast out demons who identify him as the Christ, the son of God. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12 tells us we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against what? the powers and the unseen forces of darkness where our real enemies lie. And if Jesus has power over the spiritual realm, you have nothing to fear. And it's not a battle we can win on our own by carnal means. We must have Jesus Christ who according to his gospel is the way to salvation. Amen. Lord, would you bless these men as they get into their groups tonight? Would our discussion be pleasing to you, rooted in your word? Would you give us insight that we cannot have by intellect, but only by the revelation of your spirit, giving us understanding of your word? Lord, may we walk in your ways. May we understand the gospel to be effective ministers, to be effective builders of other men. In Jesus' name.